Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to Steam Spot Think Steam Career Podcast. I am Dr. Ayo Olufade. Today, October, is a domestic violence month. And it is very important that we recognize domestic violence in our community and how to go about empowering women and anyone that is experiencing domestic violence and the kind of help that they can, they can get. Today, I am blessed and I am fortunate to be talking with Danny Schmidt Madish. Danny is going to share her experience with domestic violence. Uh, my hope, ladies and gentlemen, is that you are going to look into her own experience and hopefully you can find some inspiration. She is a phenomenal woman. Let me say a little bit about her. She is a con conversation specialist or strategist. Uh, she is a professional writing consultant and a clubhouse moderator and a curator of conversation with her show called Conversation with Danny on Clubhouse. So I came to know Danny because of her story. She raised three children. And two of her children pursue a STEM career. Our daughter is in the military. And she's able to do this despite her challenges with domestic violence. Now, I thought that her story is worth sharing and talking about as an inspiration to people that may be experiencing domestic violence in their lives. Hopefully, we all can learn from high experience as, as a way to empower us. Despite the challenges, I'm not belittling domestic violence, no, but we always have to find a way to empower ourselves so that we can overcome such a tragic and violent and disturbing experience. With that said, I would like to introduce and welcome Danny. Thank you so much for coming on Steam Sparks. Think STEAM Career Podcast. How have you been, Mel? I'm doing fine. Thank you. I'm happy to be sharing my experience here in a celebration of, of the building awareness about domestic violence during Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Did I do a good justice introducing you? Um, oh. <laughs> you sharing. Okay. <laughs> So thank you. So in today's episode, in today's episode, episode, we're going to be talking about your story, the story of resilience, perseverance, and triumph. How you, despite facing domestic violence, raised three successful children. As I've mentioned before, two pursue career in STEM. One is serving proudly in our military. By the way, please thank her for her service. When I heard about your story in one of the audio room on LinkedIn, it was truly inspiring. And I thought it would be great to have you come and share your story with the world and bring your awareness to domestic violence in our community, the BIPOC community. So you mentioned earlier that domestic violence isn't necessarily tied to socioeconomic status. But when you said that, I was blown away because a lot of us always thinking domestic violence is just for people that are in lower class and lower social community. When you said that, it struck a chord in me and I wanted to talk some more with you. What are some common misconceptions about domestic violence that you believe needs to be addressed and corrected? Let me first say that the context in which I will answer all of this is strictly my experience. And so I don't purport to be a um, domestic violence expert, an expert on domestic violence outside of my experience, my own experience. That's the first thing. And this, the reason why I'm saying that is because I was not, I was in a middle class, and maybe some people would say even an upper middle class status while this was going on. And so I know that firsthand. That is not the case. That is just not the case. And so it's very 
common, like you said, for us to think differently about who might be going through something like this or who might experience it. And that is just not the case. It's just not the case. It certainly wasn't my experience. And I don't think, I, I don't believe that my experience was from that socioeconomic standpoint, from a socioeconomic standpoint, was that unusual in the sense that there are probably more people than, that are dealing with it that are in a higher socioeconomic status than not. I also want to add that it's not just even socioeconomic, but a lot of people may think that this doesn't even happen in Christian circles or church mm. circles. And it does because we we were Christians and we were church. people. Yeah. Wow. So, so I do. I happen to know that. And like I said, this is all my experience. But this yeah. I know of other women who were just like myself, yeah. just like my. And it's just that the there's some there's a point in time where you know how to cover it. You are, you can articulate how not to articulate, if you will. Yeah. You can how not to articulate it because you're intelligent enough from your own experiences, your book smarts, whatever, to say, I need to lay low. I don't need to speak too much about that. I know how to use passive tense. I know how to use uh, past tense or passive voice to get through a lot of things. As you ask me questions, I think where this will come in. Thank you so much for sharing that. I want to take it back on the religion part because I'm also a religious person, but not religious to the extreme. I would say I probably am in the middle, <laughs> right? And I also grew up in the church. I remember coming up, growing up as a young child, seeing my father and my mother go through some such and stuff. I think, of course, we've gone over a lot of it that it is just from a lower socioeconomic standpoint, that's where. Most of the activity, if you will, happens or that it doesn't happen with people who are people of faith, that it only happens with maybe people who are melanated. And you could go on and you could just go on and on because there, like you said, there it's just it's a wide spectrum. It's from A to Z. It, it's not one particular thing. It's not one particular family type. It's not one particular relationship type. It just it's such a underground existence. And, and I think the more we speak about it, the more that it, we uncover some of the unique um, aspects of it. But everyone has to talk about it. You, can't, you yeah. can't not talk about it. So I've got to the point where I'm, I'm over it, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> and so I can speak about it. There wasn't a point in time where I couldn't because I didn't understand it. I didn't know what I had been through. But once I started introspectively looking at myself in the situation and others around me and what had actually happened, what I actually went through, then it started to become clear to me that silence covers violence. Hmm. How do you think, how do societal perception and stigma around domestic violence impact victims and their willingness uh, to come forward? In your situation, how long did it take you to come forward or to become empowered enough to say, I've had enough. I want to make changes. Years. 26 years. 26 years. 26 Why? Years. I was married for 26 years. Wow. And it was on the 25th year that I separated. And I said, this is it. I'm done. Wow. I'm done. What, and what, I left. what kept you in there for so long? So I always, I love wow. when people ask this question because I say, that is so the wrong question. Yeah. The question really is not why didn't I leave? It's and it's why didn't I leave and why did I stay? So it's really a two part question. Hmm. I'd rather answer it about from the standpoint of why I stayed. So <clears throat> I believe for my situation that I came from a long line of marriages. Hmm. My grandparents on both sides were married for over 70 years. My parents were married 43 years before my mom passed away and my dad passed away the next year because he couldn't live without. And so I come from a patriarchal family and uh, where the matriarchs were very supportive, but they were very independent women and the men let them be who they were. So I was used to that. Uh, and that is the con context in which I, I, I was reared. Now. In terms of my experience inside of my 
marriage. I idolized the institution of marriage. You idolize something that becomes marriage. Staying married, we think, think for long periods of time, that's a virtue, right? Whatever it takes to do that, great. But I always used to wonder, how is it that people that can stay married for so long and then all of a sudden they can get divorced? Now I know. And so for me, Mm. I didn't want to be the first generation of divorce. I just didn't. I felt that it was, that was one thing. The other thing was I didn't grow up around domestic violence. I'd never heard the term. I didn't see any violence in my home. I didn't hear any arguments in our home that were escalated like like that I was used to in a domestic violence situation. I know people get you know, heat an argument, so to speak, but I never as a child was ever afraid when my parents were in a misunderstanding. It wasn't that deep. So when I started experiencing things that were looked deeper than that, I started questioning myself, okay, was it me? And oftentimes, in a, for me in the situation, I just questioned myself and I was like, what if? and I know it wasn't, you're not supposed to be um, treated, mistreated. No one should hit you. No one, nothing like that should be going on. But there is a point in time where you question yourself and you say, if I just do this, hmm. then this would happen. Or if I don't, if I don't do this, then that would happen. And so you're in your own trial and error phase. You're in your own test experiment phase. And why that makes sense, if there are children involved, it's just inherent that it makes sense to some of us to not stir the pot. For me, I did not want my children in the legal system when they were minors. I just didn't want it. So I felt it was incumbent upon myself to make sure that didn't happen. And so I was trying to work through it and not excusing the violence in a sense, because I knew that was wrong, but I thought maybe if I did things differently over time, that things would change. And they did. Wow. It just took me back to uh, my own personal experience. I wonder if that was the same reason why my mother stayed in that relationship for a long time. Uh, I, I really do wonder if that was the reason why. And I wonder how many women are caught up or men are caught up in situations like you're describing, like my mother has experienced in a violent relationship and that and that they really should not be in there. Um, and I also wonder how much religion has an impact on that because I don't know. I struggle with that too, because in the Bible, it says, uh, if I'm not mistaken, unless with the exception of infidelity, right? A man should not divorce his wife, right? Okay. Now let's park it right there. I'm so glad you said that because let's park it right there. Excellent. So Malachi 2, this, oh, I'm so glad because I want to nail this thing on the head. (laughs) So while I was going through my separation, I needed answers. I needed answers to stop divorce because I was at that point where I was, this is not going to work. This is not going to work. And I had, but now understand this. I had already invested 26 years of my life at that point in time. And I got married at 26. So at that point in time, I'd invested half of my life. Mm -hmm. I was 52 when I left. And I got to a point where I said, wait a minute. And I went to my ex-husband and I said, listen, if I can stay with you for 26 years of this stuff going on, I can stay with you if you, number one, admit you have a problem, number two, you stop doing this, and number three, get help for it, and, and that's it. And we can go another 26 years in a different way. I was willing to do that. Hmm. And he was not. He specifically said that the only way this is going to happen is if you get out of my life. Wow. Oh, Okay. So that was very clear to me. That was one of the the things that wasn't the old, that wasn't the ultimate thing that made me leave, but that was, yeah, that was very clear to me. So I knew I was headed toward divorce, but I strongly believe that the person that sits back and watches what happens is the one that doesn't really want it and wants to see if there's any hope. And that was me. Um, I did want to see if there was any hope. Um, I didn't, I just didn't want it. I just didn't want a divorce. That's just how, that's just how Danny was wired. 
Um, and eventually my husband was the one that filed for it. And I believe that I, I truly believe from a Christian standpoint, I let him go. I let him go. But let's get back to what you said. Let's get back to what you said. All right. So here's the thing. You, the Bible says God hates divorce, but let me tell you, churches are taking that out of context. And what do I mean by that? Because that, if I'm not mistaken, no. And, and if you're listening to this and you've got a Bible or whatever, you can Google it. Malachi 2.15 says God hates divorce, but that's 2.15 or whatever. B it says, for this reason, God hates divorce. For this reason, the English language, there's got to be a reason. And, and there's 14 verses before th- that verse. So the reasons are all before that verse. And some in those reasons, he's very clear. You've been violent with your wife. You haven't taken care of the wife of your youth. You've been cheating on her. You've been doing all of these things. And he says, and so for this reason, God hates divorce. So it's not just that God hates divorce. You can't do it. God hates divorce for a reason. And it's not just infidelity. Because if you're thinking about infidelity as a sexual thing, let me tell you something. The minute you are, if you're a married person and you put your hands on your wife or your husband or whatever, you have broken your covenant. Mm-hmm. Oh. You've broken your covenant. You've broken your marriage covenant. Mm-hmm. So you have to, you can't just, this is not just what it seems and what churches are teaching you. And so the church was my biggest enemy. Besides the legal system, the church was my biggest enemy. So what do I mean by that? So I went to a church and I said, this is going on, this is going on. And they told me I had no biblical grounds for divorce knowing I was being physically abused. And I said, cool, I'm out. I'm out. I gave a resignation letter, official resignation letter, and said, I'm out. Oh, I didn't even have to do that. I, I just could have not shown up again. But that's not how I do. I try to roll out gracious, graciously. So when I tried to roll out graciously, given the resignation letter, made it very clear why I was leaving and my children were coming with me, they told me I had no biblical grounds for divorce. And I was like, okay, fine. That church, which was a black Baptist church in Southwest Atlanta. Let's get this clear. A black Baptist church in Southwest Atlanta told me I had no biblical grounds for divorce because it, knowing that my husband was physically abusing me. And so I left on a resignation letter and that same church excommunicated me. Oh, dear. Excommunicated. So for those of you listening, don't know what that means in a Christian church. That means they kicked me out. Wow. And told me I could not come back to that church. That's hard. Oh, absolutely. So on top of trying to deal with all of this, trying to understand it, even for myself, for my own faith, for my own mental stability, I had a church to excommunicate me while I'm trying to figure it all out. So now I have no church. I don't trust church. I don't trust church anymore. And then the legal system is horrible. So you want to talk about the things that that we can do to help believe women the first time. I stopped calling the police because the legal system, they don't want to get involved. People do not want to get and 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 I think anyone on a police force or even EMT people will tell you, we don't want to get involved in that because it might cost us our lives, depending on how crazy folks are, right? Oh what God. the circumstances were of the of the of the situation. Yeah. I've experienced that. I've had false police reports written on me. I had a false police report written on me. And also my 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 ex-husband too. They wrote it on both of us. And so that's how I knew the whole thing was a lie. And I said, okay, that's not working. I, I don't want to chant that again. And then so where do you go? What do you do? If you're asking what a community can do, a community can believe a woman the first time. Now, I will say this to you. It is very difficult for people to get involved. And I understand that because people just don't want to get involved in other people's mess. Folks got their own stuff going on. I get it. But if you really want to help someone, the only way to really do it is to give them a safe haven to go, a safe place to go. I had friends that did that. I was a realtor in the, in the South Georgia, South Atlanta area while this was going on. And prior to me becoming homeless, 
And that's a big deal. That's a, that was a reality for me. I did not have a home to go to because once I decided to leave my ex-husband, he stayed in the home. I left while he was on a four-day business trip. I just took all my stuff out and I left. And I went to a place that a woman gave me a safe haven to go to. And I stayed there until her house got foreclosed on. And then I moved in with somebody else. And then those people, I moved in with somebody else. And then eventually I went to a women's shelter because I didn't have anywhere else to go. I had exhausted all my comforts <laughs> uh, that people were giving me at the time. You can't stay with people forever. Yeah. And so I was just fortunate enough to have those kinds of support systems along the way while I'm figuring it out. But a lot of people do not have that. So it's important for people, if you think something is going on, take somebody out of their situation and say, hey, come here. I, I see what's happening or I think this is what's happening. And you don't have to explain it to me because a lot of times we don't even understand what's going on for ourselves. And so there's not a lot of answers that we can give because it, it, especially in my situation, I didn't even, I've never seen it. I've never heard it. I've studied it. I hadn't experienced it. So I didn't know what was going on. I just did not know what was going on. And so I will total survive. Wow. Wow. It's amazing. It, it's, yeah, the question that you asked is a profound one. Where, what do people, where do people experiencing domestic violence go? If you can't trust the law enforcement, you can't trust the, then what do you do? It's amazing. I'm reading a, a book right now, an audio book. It's called no, in, uh, no visible bruises uh, in preparation for our show. Uh, you have to read the book. I'm not endorsing the book, but I will endorse the book. It's not about <laughs> not being paid for the book, but right, I understand. I it's an incredible story. This reporter following the tragic story of, of a man losing his daughter to a, a violent husband who, who was very possessive. But in another story that I also am listening to, I haven't finished reading or listening to that story. It's how the woman got the courage of leaving her husband. She was in that situation for quite a long time until she had the courage of one day just packing her stuff. Uh, while she was planning to get out, she never told her husband that she was leaving. She never told her our friends that she was leaving with the fear that it will get back to her husband. And a day that when she was ready to leave, uh, she left. And she knew that her husband always called at a certain time. She quickly came back to get the phone, to answer his phone. But once the conversation was done, she left and never returned. But he still followed her. But there has to be help somewhere for people experiencing domestic violence, get out of that bad situation. Uh, now, I want to ask you another question. Your children, now they're successful. So how did, the, how did the, the, that domestic violence, that experience, how did it impact your children? Both Now you're looking back, both immediately and in the long term. Can you speak to that, please? I can't speak to that. They should speak to that. I think that there should be an entire subject matter discussion with children who are victims of domestic violence, like my three children were. I yeah. can tell you. Maybe that I, if I may interject, I know you're interested in doing a podcast. Okay. Uh, maybe that's something you can take on. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to take that on. I really am. It, but I have to get my children's permission. And sometimes kids are just are, are resilient. and. Um, Believe it or not, more so than we know. And I know it affected them um, deeply in, at certain stages. And now they're older and they reflect and they have a, a healthy relationship with their father, uh, which I've always encouraged. And so even during the separation and divorce, I, I encouraged that. But that was something that they had to get to. I couldn't navigate that for them. I, I didn't, and, and nor did I try. I, 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 that was, we all were getting through it. And we got, you know, our individually our own ways. And my children, if my children were not my children, they would be my best friends. I was homeschooling my children during my entire, during this whole situation. Um, I homeschooled from 1990 to 2005. And um, oftentimes um, my, my ex-spouse was not at home because he traveled a bit. 
So as they got older, that was the case. And it wasn't like a daily thing that we were dealing with as it was when they were more so when they were smaller. So as time moved on, it became less and less of a pattern. Um, it became few and far between. But I will say that my children and I, we were just joined at the hip. We were joined at the hip in a very healthy way. I had, I, I, my support system was a track team that I founded in South Georgia, in, in Fayetteville, Georgia. And I founded a youth track team for USA Track and Field and AAU. And that was our outlet. That was what kept us away from the house. It, and all three of them were involved. And then when they did transition out to public school in middle school and high school, they were still involved in track and field all year round because now they had a high school schedule plus a summer schedule. And we traveled in the summer. We traveled all over the United States. So we were gone. We, I made sure that they were gone. I made sure that we were just gone. Hmm. And, and that was something that my ex-spouse did not appreciate, but that was a, a matter of survival for me. And it was the way that I could keep my kids on a schedule and keep them normal. And that was very important. If you know anything about child development, schedules and normalcy are the key. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and no. uh, my pediatrician daughter in love has made clear that for me, made, made, made that very clear to me as a grandmother <laughs> mm. <laughs> when I have my grandchildren. Yeah. So that is that was very key for us. That was a matter of survival. And so. Everyone's not able to do that, though. That's why I'm saying every situation is different. Everyone's resources are different. My coaches didn't even know I was going through domestic violence. They had wow. no idea. They had no idea. I found that I had that team for probably, they didn't even know it, let's see, to, for probably for 15 years. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, they, did, they didn't know. They didn't know. Uh, but, but did your children know about the domestic violence? Uh, Absolutely, did it impact yeah. them? Oh. My children have seen it. My children called pastors. My children have called my, my daughter called police one time or whatever. I Sometimes I don't even know what's going on. I'm, I'm in it. And they see it and I don't know what they do. But I'm like, yeah, they, they've absolutely seen it. Absolutely hmm. seen it. But when my, my, I have a daughter and two sons in that order. And so when my sons, and particularly one of them, got older, he made it very clear to my ex-husband that was not going to continue hmm. and if wow. it did there were consequences to it yeah but when that but the turning point for me was when that child left and went to college we took him to college and i had this idea that oh now we're empty nesters everything's going to get better we'll just restart jump start our relationship blah 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 no it just started all over again and wow. my son was smart enough intuitive enough and discerning enough to say to me, mom, I don't even want to go to college because I know if I leave this house, this is going to start all over again. Oh, my God. And I was like, don't worry about it, man. It's right. not going to be the case. We're, we're past that. And, and he was absolutely right. He was absolutely right. When you're in a situation, and some people who may listening may know, unfortunately, they'll be able to relate to this. But when you're in a situation, arguments over nothing escalate. And they escalate to a point where you can't even remember where the thing started, right? Because it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And in my case, I was packing for a trip to my godparents' 60th wedding anniversary back in New Jersey, which is my home state. And both of us were invited. He chose not to attend, but I wasn't going to miss it. And I don't think he liked that. Because one thing that the perpetrators do not like is when you have a support system. Mm -hmm. And they don't like when you have family near you and 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 extended and just an extended family or, or any kind of support system. They don't like that. Hmm. And so they will like to take you away from that. Wow. But I always resisted against that. And so that was always a, a, a bone of contention, even in our relationship. How close I was to my parents. I wasn't close to my parents. I was close to my parents before I met. So that 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 wasn't unique to, to the marriage. That was just who we were as a family. I was close to my extended family, my grandparents, my godparents, my god sisters, my god brothers. That's just how it was. And, and my cousins, just name, name it. And when I was packing for this trip, he was very, he didn't, he was very adamant, just thought that he didn't want me to have that support system. And at some point in time, he did all the things that he normally does, hitting and calling me out of my name and everything. But the, the turning point for me was when he spit in my face. Wow. When that man spit in my face, I said to myself, if you don't get out of this relationship too immediately, you are going to be dead. Yeah. And I knew that. Mm -hmm. And so I went on that trip, went to my godparents' anniversary, 60th anniversary celebration. I came back. 
I said, look, this is the deal. You want to get help? Nope. Am I getting any help? I said, cool. Okay. And I remembered he was going on a business trip. And I remember it was going to be a four-day business trip. So I just asked. I said, I'm sorry. What, what, what's the date, dates of that trip again? And while he was gone, I packed up and I went to one of my athletes' mother's homes. was a single mom, too. That's what I mean by a safe haven. Now, yeah. when I left, my children didn't know where I was. I was teaching at a u- local university while I was underground trying to figure my life out. And that's when I had to stop teaching because I couldn't bring the normal Danny to the classroom. Yeah. I just couldn't. I had too much going on. I couldn't. I couldn't. And if you had me that semester, I pray to God one of my students are listening to this. If you had me that semester, you probably everybody got an A. It was hard to correct papers. It was hard to do anything. But I gave it the best. I gave yeah. it the best. I, I gave it all I had. I did the mm. best I could with what I had, like Marshall said. So anyway, yeah, that's it in a nutshell. I'm sorry about what you went through. And I was just thinking about your son who was going to college and worried about you, how that burden must have weighed in his heart and his mind. Being but let me tell you what my children, what happened after that. Yes. So when I did, my children were all only college by that time. And I got them together and I spoke to them very clearly about what I was about to do. And that was to separate. I didn't know where the divorce was headed because no one had filed at the time. But my children were away in college. And when my children came home, my sons came home uh, for Thanksgiving uh, that year. They traveled all the way from from down south to come back home to well, from actually up I should say up north, but they were in a they were in Norfolk, Virginia area. And when they came home, they couldn't get in the house. So my ex had locked had changed all the locks. He didn't want anyone in the house but himself. And so my children actually, thankfully, I had friends, I had extended family from New Jersey that who I had sold a home to as a realtor, they moved from New Jersey to Georgia. I ended up being in their home because I'm old as that. So God takes care of babies and fools. Yeah. <laughs> and I wasn't a baby at the time. So anyway, yeah. So my children went with me everywhere they could. And so when you know, I had left the first place that I was at with my athlete's mom's house, which was on a large farm, you know, woods somewhere, which was a great place for me to just go underground. And then uh, when I resurfaced from that, I ended up going into this home I'm talking about with my friends from Jersey. And then, and then the next place I went to was a women's shelter. I had nowhere else to go. And it wasn't until my office mate, my real estate office mate, she had a closing. This is my angel on earth. And I'd be remiss if I didn't tell this part of the story, but she had a closing. And I remember one day she asked me if I want to go to movies. And I was in a women's shelter and I really hadn't told anyone where I was. I, you can't, you really can't tell anyone where you are when you go to the women's shelter. And she asked me, she says, where do you live now? And I was like, I said, I'm at the women's shelter. And she said, oh no, we're going to take care of all of that. So she, she brought me to her home with her husband and her mom and her kids and all of that. I came, but my, there was nowhere for my children to go when they came home that summer. So my children actually went to another family's home. And so we had this whole support system around us and yeah. people were supporting us. And that's what happened. And eventually this same uh, woman who took me out of that homeless shelter, when she had a closing, she gave me a check and she said, go start your life over again, and get your own place. And that's how my life started over again. Wow. Uh, that is so amazing. How God fortified you despite your horrible terrible experience. The support system that you had came true for you. I never, I lost a church, but I never lost my faith. Yeah. And there's a big difference. Mm. Oh my God. How did you do that? (laughs) Because I think- I'm just saying, when you don't lose your faith, when you don't lose your faith, I I have to tell you, I wish I could show it to you, but my baby son, the one that did not want to leave because I told you that part of the story, he didn't want to even go to college because he said, well, this is going to start all over again. I was on the wings of angels. Hmm. I told them, I said, I believe I'm on the wings of angels. My, that same son has one tattoo on his body and it's across his shoulder on the back. And it says on the wings of angels. <laughs> wow. What a legacy. Wow. What a legacy. 
Wow, that's amazing. And, and I want to say something else because this thing goes very deep. And let me tell you how deep. So when I tried to get back into my home, I wanted to get back into my home for my so my kids would have so we could have some kind of stability. It was three of us, it was four of us, and one of mm-hmm. one of my ex stayed, stayed in the entire home, four bedroom, three bath home, two car garage on an acre of land. Come on. And we went, we petitioned for a judge, and and I think his attorney just knew the judge. The judge said, No, you're not gonna get back in that home. And and I remember that day, my boys were in court with me when that judge and when his attorney said, we don't care if her, she and her children have to live on the streets. We don't want her back in that home. Oh, wow. And that's exactly what happened. And their father and that attorney and their mom, and they were on my side and was on the side with this attorney. And I will tell you this, my son, that same son that has on the wings of angels tattooed across his, across his back from shoulder to shoulder, he said to me, mom, take me down to the courtroom. I want to change my middle name because Hmm. his middle name was his father's first name. And I said, son, absolutely not. And let me tell you why. Because you are the only child that I had that was where I was not physically abused when I was carrying that child. Wow. That is why you have your father's name. And so you are my mark on life. Not his, mine. The act of forgiveness, the act of love. That's exactly right. That's, that's all it is. And so in order to move on, every new beginning comes from some other beginnings. And I was able to, if you see this book behind me with the, the woman with the orange turf on it. Yeah, survived, that's beautiful. Cele- celebrating yeah. Life Beyond Domestic Violence. 13 of us, including the woman on the cover, her name is um, Tahira Ogletree. She has the Ode to Hear Foundation. Anyone dealing with domestic violence or who wants to know more about it should get that book. It's on Amazon. It's called Survivors Celebrating Life Beyond Domestic Violence by Tahira Ogletree. And I will tell you, the opportunity to write my story in that book, The Danny Mathis Story, is, was very cathartic for me. I just had to get it out. I just had to get it out. And that book, my story is based on a letter that I actually wrote my ex-husband a a year before the separation. So I wrote the letter in 2008. The separation happened in 2009. And then the divorce was final in 2010. Mm -hmm. And so that's my story. And it's broken down into how I saw it affecting each of my children and Mm -hmm. ultimately how it was affecting me. Thank you so much for sharing that. I really would like to do a deep dive into the impact on your children and how uh, you were able to turn adversity into a motivation and how you were able to ensure that your children were on the path of success. Uh, because it's a story that um, other parents, other people going through domestic violence needs to hear especially when children are involved, because it can be, it can be major in the life of not only the, the women that are experiencing that, but also the children's coming up uh, in that situation. But I want to zero in on this because we, I don't want to take too much of your time. We have to do another show okay. that deals with your children. But I want to zero in on how important is the community support in preventing domestic violence or supporting survival. The theme of everything you've been sharing has always come back to the support system that you had it helps you quite a lot. How important is the community support? How vital is it? It's everything. You can only get support if you speak on this. Mm-hmm. Because most people are not going to speak on this because the unsafest time is when you start speaking on it or when you start trying to leave. So you need to understand that there are probably people that are just in prison. They are just, I just sometimes, I, I tried to leave physically many times, but my children were stair steps. And so I was dealing with it. three car seats at, at one time and bat and, and diaper. Yeah, my children, yeah, my children were stair steps. When I had my last child, my daughter was three. Wow. <laughs> Her brother was two. Yeah, my children were stair steps. And so there were many times, there were there were more than two or three times that I tried to physically leave and just go retreat either to my parents or to some friends or whatever. And I it, it's just timing. You just can't can't it's timing is everything, right? Timing is everything. And particularly when you're trying to escape 
um, a bad situation, timing is everything. I couldn't just jump in the car myself and go. It'd been much easier. You got strep, then you get diaper bags, I time everything. A lot of times I just didn't time it. But but the community support was everything for me, but it could only be as good as I was letting them know I needed. So there's a place in Georgia. Um, so a couple of things also. Um, a lot of times there are pets involved. And I really want to say this because you're not going to hear this coming from some other people, maybe, because maybe they don't have pets or maybe they haven't had this experience with their pets in domestic violence. But I had a pet hmm. who was an emotional support animal to me long before emotional support animals were a thing. And I had a cat that I had adopted from a shelter. And when he was six, seven weeks old, eight weeks old. And eventually, when I separated, I left that cat at the house with my ex-husband. Hmm. And I was very concerned because I knew that cat was my support system. He knew that and he would have gotten, he was ready to get rid of the cat. And in fact, the day that I went back to get the cat, he was about to let that cat just go out on the street and hmm. said, you came in the nick of time. And, but I had to let my cat go with the neighbor until I could figure out where was my cat going? Because I'm homeless. I can't bring a cat into everybody's home. And most people don't even like him. Sure. The black. They really don't want that. But, but I found an organization called the Hensa House in Georgia that shelters pets of domestic violence. And so that alleviated a lot of, of, of concern for me about what was going to happen to my cat. I was going to have to give him up, and I didn't want to do that. My kids didn't want me to do that, but we had nowhere else for him to go. So what a Hensa House did was they came in, they took care of all his shots, they found a place, a foster home. Yeah. I couldn't, of course, because of safety purposes, I was not able to disclose. They were not able to disclose to me where he was because they didn't yeah. want me trying to go get him and all that kind of stuff. They didn't, you, you can't bring domestic violence everywhere. With you, yeah. Right? yeah. Not safe for other people and other people just don't want to be involved. So a Hemsa House is aware, aware of that. And they actually gave me a scholarship, a $300 scholarship for my cat. Yeah. That's the running joke. Mom, you can find scholarships for athletes. You can find scholarships for animals. You can find scholarships for anybody. And I was eventually reunited with my cat after about, after my friend gave me her closing check and I was able to find my own place. Like it, it was like over eight months. And I'm so sorry. he, and he just passed in May. I'm so sorry. he was with me for 20 years. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How are you doing with a loss? Of oh, it's the first time since the <laughs> divorce that I've never been alone. It is the first time I've been alone. And it's weird. It's just like weird. It's just me here. So I've been talking to myself a lot more out loud. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do, you, do you know if there are more pro than a programs like the Hamza House for domestic violent cats? It's uh, not just cats. It's all kinds of animals. They have farm um, animals. Oh. You, it, it's whatever animal you have. Horses. Right. Wow. It could be anything. Goats, wow. cats, dogs, birds. I, I, I think they need to open a branch all across the nation. Yeah, I have no idea. I know, I think it is the only organization, it's a 501c3 organization, nonprofit organization of its kind in America. I really do. I just, thankfully, I was able to, again, another community resource, but imagine if they could clone that in every state or more across the nation, we'd probably, it just helped me emotionally, it was a big help to me. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can just see that. Now, now, now here's my next question. And this is going to be leading us towards uh, the closing. And then we can come back and do a more deep dive later. I have a couple of questions. And this is more for younger people because your story is very vital for young people. One, what advice or how can we teach young people about healthy relationship and the boundaries to prevent future cycles of domestic violence. And also, what are some of the signs they need to be watch, watching out? Because it's one thing to fall in love. <laughs> we all fall in love, but you live for a long time with this individual, but that individual, if they're not Treating you with you. So two questions that you're asking. I think that first question should be asked to children because I wasn't, I'm, I was 26 when I got married. That's considered, it's not young. It's young, but it's not as young as I think you're asking the question about in terms of younger people that may, may, may be more of a 
because interpart now it's known as intimate partner violence IPV, hmm. and CDC has done an extensive dive into IPV into inter- in- intimate partner violence. And so I think people should look at that and see what the stats are and who's all in that. There are, you can go on cdc.gov and see all of that information. I think warning signs are the signs of typical narcissists and and love bombing and things like that. And all of those are these new terms. Those weren't things that we were discussing 26 years ago, but they're discussing. So I think that's a question that would be better asked of children who are not my my, my children's generation as opposed to my own generation. The other thing, and then of course, if I had known, I wouldn't have made the mistake. So I'm, I, I never like to answer it as though I'm an expert on what you should do or what you, you know, could have. I know now maybe what I could have done differently, and that was just get out sooner. But I would have still been in something to have gotten out. But the other question I think you asked was, tell me the second question. The sign that the sign that young people should be looking for. That's what I'm saying. I, I, I just don't. I, it's narcissism. Okay. It's love bombing. It's, if any person, let me tell you something, here's the sign. If you feel that you have to set yourself on fire to make somebody else warm, mm-hmm. that's a sign. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's such a powerful <laughs> statement. No. Or if you feel like you have to omit pieces of who you are mm-hmm. just to build somebody else up, that's yeah. a sign. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That is powerful. That is powerful. Man, that is powerful. That's profound. Like, I hope the young people you're learning. <laughs> yeah, uh, old people do. Um, <laughs> old so, old people. Um, one last question I, can, I have to sure. ask. How have the movement like Me Too influenced the conversation around domestic violence? Has that helped or has that really made matter worse? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not in a, uh, I was not in a Me Too thing. I was just okay. in a Me Too. I wasn't in a Me Too movement. I was just in a Me movement. I was just trying to move me. I was trying to move Me Too. But like I said, I think domestic violence is the hush, is is so hush. I think people are a little bit more, for whatever reason, prone to talk more about sexual assault than they are about um, Mm. domestic violence. I don't know why that is. I really don't know why that is. But I can tell you, it is very hard for um, us to speak up about it because you're afraid. You just yeah. live in such fear. And I'm not saying that this, those who are sexually assaulted don't live in that fear because I was sexually assaulted at a very early age with a relative um, who's no longer living, by the way. But but um, it was very difficult for me to talk to my parents. I, I didn't tell my parents for three years. Hmm. And so and this was long before I wasn't even in high school when that happened. But yes, but I was able to talk about that and I never spoke about domestic violence to my parents when I was an older woman with kids. My parents didn't really know until one night I was almost, I was almost killed. And, and I had nowhere else to go but to their home with my three small children. I, I had nowhere else to go. I needed a protective order. I had to be protected and all of that kind of stuff. My children wanted my children protected. I wanted my parents protected. Yeah. Um, there was all of that legal rigmarole we had to go through and laws of custody, not custody, but civil suits, criminal suits, all things like that. It was, yeah, yeah. you don't want, you know, you don't want that. You don't want that. You yeah. just might, it might as well, I should have left that. I would have been yeah. okay. The same yeah. fate that carried me through the whole thing could have carried me through half of all of that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just, like I go back to the thing, the issue of that I did not want to get divorced. I didn't want to be beaten. I didn't want to be misused. I didn't want to be abused. I didn't want to be unloved. I didn't want any of that. But I, more than any of that, I did not want a divorce. And that's because Dan, her mistake was idolizing the institution of marriage, being more concerned about that than the people in it, starting with myself. Thank you so much for that sharing, for sharing your experience with us. My hope is that your experience will empower someone out there. My hope also is that more people will come forward and share their stories. And now they also know that you're interested in doing a podcast. Uh, so you may be doing a podcast on domestic violence. Mine is more on STEM. I was just in, in, I was just fired up and I was inspired with the fact that 
How I appreciate the woman, deviation. Yeah. It wasn't standard. It's not a standard deviation. Yeah, I just like how did Danny, this woman, despite her experience, able to raise three phenomenally successful young people? Two in the STEM. One is has a PhD in physics. The University of Michigan. <laughs> University of let's make let's make Life. that clear. <laughs> Go blue. Uh, you know, yeah, my, my daughter served in the United States military and U.S. Army Reserves. All three of my children are college graduates. My daughter has a, a Bachelor of Arts in Hospitality and Hotel Management from Johnson & Wales. And she's studying now to have, get her degree in a Master's in Public Administration. My first son, middle child, has a Ph.D. in Physics from the University of Michigan. And then my youngest one ha is a nurse. He has his BSN from St. Petersburg College, and he's also an RA as well. You, you, can't beat, you can't beat that, and I just want people to hear your story. Hopefully, yeah. they can be inspired by your story. You're a member of the BIPOC community, and you're able to do that, not to lessen the experience that people are going through, no, but we can learn from one another, right? Wow, the Absolutely. strategies that and you And let's utilize. just say this, too. If you are in a domestic violence situation, number one, stay yeah. safe, but don't stay. Yes. That's my new model. My new model is be safe, but don't stay. Now, it's the, it's, there's a real juggling act with all of that, like I mentioned before. But if you're looking for help on the internet, make sure that you click that. When you're going on these sites, like the domestic violence hotline site things, there's a little red icon button at the top that will say stay safe. So that mm -hmm. if your perpetrator comes in and sees you on the internet, and you, you really don't want that to happen you you need to click that red button that's a good that's a good advice please if you are experiencing domestic violence it is important that you seek help Being... uh, doc, the other thing i want to mention not to cut you up but the other thing i have to mention before i forget it is that, that you can do 211 like if you're 411 or 911 211 is the domestic violence help resource line so you can go to 1-800-799-7233 Two three three. That's one eight hundred seven nine nine seven two three three. Or you can just dial two one one. Well, I believe there is also a text that is eight eight seven eight eight uh, that you can uh, text uh, if you need any okay. help. Okay, uh, I didn't know that. Good. You know uh, that is really good, and they are open twenty uh, twenty four seven. Please reach out. It's very important. I just want to thank you so much, Danny for taking this time for sharing your experience and hopefully your experience will empower and encourage someone who is going through that experience to seek help and uh, hopefully that will your your experience also will inspire them uh, in, especially if they have children uh, to stay the course because at the end of the day not to stay in the domestic situation. No, no, no I understand. No. Yeah. Because right. just like my mother, right? If my mother didn't get out of that domestic situation, I will not be here in the United States of America. But she got out. It's the same story with you, Danny. You got out of that bad situation. And, yep. and you stay focused with your children. Uh, you were able to come up with strategy, like starting a club, right? And your children. That was my deal. That was part of my. That, that was part of my process of getting through things. But Duck, before you leave, I do want to say this: yes. forgiveness heals. Forgiveness heals you, the victim. It heals you. I'm no longer a victim. I'm out of it. I was a victim while it was happening. I'm a survivor, and That's I'm true. a thriver now. Before I'm a survivor, right now I'm just thriving past it. But I will tell you that forgiveness is the key. Last last year, this time, I was in. I was back. It, it, my alma mater, doing some business there. I'm on a board there. And and I met up with my ex and his fraternity and everything. And we had a great time. You know, yeah. Dance, whatever. You don't know how God, your faith, can carry you, whatever you believe in. You let your faith carry you through. And if you do not abandon your faith on a bend. And we're going to stop with that. Well done, Danny. I just want to like to thank everyone for showing up today and for listening to this episode of uh, our podcast on resilience, perseverance, and triumph with Danny. I believe we need to do another episode on how 
you were able to successfully raise three children. Who well, two of them were uh, in STEM or STEAM, and uh, one served in the military. Thank her for her service. So, I'd like to remind everyone that STEAM play a pivotal role within our community. It encompasses vital elements like our community health advancement, economical growth, agricultural resources, waste management technological advances, and more. These areas are crucial for sustainability. STEAM Spark, a thought-provoking podcast, uh, dials into the dynamic realm of science, technology, arts, maths. It dials into intersection of this career and pathways while shedding light on the lack of representation of Black, Indigenous, and people of color within STEAM collegial programs and professional careers. As the landscape of STEAM continues to transform, this podcast will continue to engage with accomplished individuals like Danny, who champions STEAM education, as you can see, to our, ch to of our children, to pursue a STEAM career and they're professional in, 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 in STEM field. We'll continue to invite men and women like Danny, who are champion of STEAM education and thrive in STEAM careers. Doing so, enabling viewers like you to gain valuable insight into how the BIPOC community can actively participate in the STEAM field. Additionally, it guides boosting our BIPOC representation within the STEAM to enrich research, data collection, and innovation process through diverse perspectives. This aim, this conversation that we're having with Danny and many others, aim to foster awareness about the significance of STEAM and STEM education, provoking or providing empowerment that could pave the way for the next generation of BIPOC individuals to envision themselves as part of STEM and STEAM innovation. This episode, I know it's a little bit different from what I'm used to doing, but I wanted to bring awareness to domestic violence. Thank you. And Thank you. I wanted to invite someone who has experienced domestic violence but was resilient in overcoming that with love and forgiveness. And she, is a, she was able to stay focused with various strategies to help our children become very successful. I would like you to, I would like to invite you to please connect with Danny. She has a wealth of experience. I think in my view, I think she needs to have her own podcast. Literally, I think she working has on it. To so, share. Working on it. Since I finished I, my, I, let me finish my book. Yeah, yeah. Consider consider also the book that she recommend right there. The lady with the orange hat. Uh, we call it Gilly. Survivors in, celebrating Gilly. life beyond. Look it up. Get her book, ladies and gentlemen. And she's coming up with another book. Yeah, I forgot to say. If they like the program that I'm sharing, let them endorse me. Right, let them endorse <laughs> me. And by the way. I just wrote a children's book. I totally forgot to mention it. I wrote oh, a I yeah, I wrote a children's book. I don't know if you can see it. How yeah, have you ever what? <laughs> wow. Yeah, wow. So got it. Cracked shell. So got, it's cracked glass. Shell. Cracked shell. I see that. So it's, please check out this book. Buy it. It actually helped uh, with my initiative as it pertains to STEM and STEAM education. Thank you so much, everyone. See you next time. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank yeah. you.